I am Professor Collins, and this is your Daily Dose of Statistics. Today we're, uh, we're going to continue our talk on inferential statistics, um, and specifically today we are going to start to dig into hypothesis testing. Um, there are several tests that we'll do for hypothesis testing, um, statistical tests, and um, we'll start by discussing just a general introduction to hypothesis testing. So throughout this series of lectures, we will be going around uh, about six of them. We'll start with a general introduction to hypothesis testing. Um, then we'll bridge into a one sample or single sample case. Then we'll discuss paired sample cases, independent samples cases, analysis of variance, and chi-squared. Um, so I'm not going to get into specifically what each of these are yet. Um, first, I'm just going to give a general introduction into hypothesis testing. So let's start uh, talking about hypothesis testing. So what is hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing, what it does is it statistically estimates the probability of a sample outcome occurring compared to the population. So what that means is, is it compares sample data to population data. Um, and it asks the question, is this sample data significantly or statistically different than the population, right? So is there, the question here is, is there something particular about this group of people, this sample of people that makes them different from somebody else? Um, so the, the most classic example is if we were to put somebody in, a, in, in some sort of program, for example, say a work program, um, we could compare those people's uh, wages, for example, to other like people and ask the question, did this program enhance the wages of these people? Um, another thing that hypothesis test testing can do, it, it, it can compare um, data from two representative samples. So men and women, for example, can be compared across the same construct or across the same measurement. Um, and what this does is hypothesis testing is also t uh, called significance testing. And what that means is, is it asks the question, are these data significantly different than the population data or significantly different than um, another set of data um, or another mean, for example? And um, we can test that statistically and we'll talk about what significance means um, when we get into the section on alpha levels. So let's do a quick example, right? So we have population data here, right? So we have a population distribution with a particular mean, standard deviation, normally curved, um, mean, median, and mode are the same in this example. And what we can do is we, compare, we can compare that data to sample population, right? Or excuse me, a, a, a sample um, set of data. So we can ask the question something like, uh, what's, what's the difference between these two uh, means and is there a significant difference here? So we could compare, for example, a, a, a small group of women who say maybe went through a program, uh, maybe a work training program, and we can compare their averages, the smaller sample, to the population of women, right? And ask the question, do these women who went through this program, are they significantly different than the population of women who did not? Uh, another thing we can do here is we can compare across groups. So we can compare um, two sample means against each other. So we can compare men to women, for example, and ask the question, is there a significant difference across these two means? Um, and if so, what does that mean? So let's jump into hypothesis and what a hypothesis is. So a hypothesis is a proposed explanation of some phenomenon, right? It's, it's stating, it's making a statement toward the explanation of some phenomenon. The counter to that is called the null hypothesis. So the hypothesis is, is typically called the hypothesis or the research hypothesis. The null hypothesis is, is the opposite of that. So it is the proposed uh, it, what it states is that the proposed phenomenon occurred due to chance, right? So um, while the hypo hypothesis proposes an explanation of some phenomenon, um, Y occurred because of X, for example, 
the null hypothesis states that there is no relationship there. And so let's take an example of um, welders. And so say we had a group of welders who went through a, a work training program, and we're interested in wondering, we're, we're interested in the question of, do they get paid more than other people? Right, so we have a group of welders who go through this welder training program, and what we can do is we can ask the question, or we can, we can put them through the program, and then we can collect their income data and ask the question, are their incomes significantly different than the incomes of all other welders? And so if it is, we can have our hypothesis here that because of the work training program, the welder training program, their incomes were increased. So there was something about that program, so right, that's the explanation of that phenomenon. Um, the explanation is the work training program, the welder training program, and the phenomenon is increased wages. Um, the null hypothesis, on the other hand, would say there is no relationship there. That's uh, for some reason there's a chance situation um, that that occurred. It didn't occur because of the program. It occurred become, because of some other random chance. And so that's what we're testing with these models moving forward. So there's several aspects to hypothesis testing that we really need to discuss. And so the first is the critical region. Now we've, you've seen the critical region before when we talk about z-scores, um, but we talked about them at the individual level or the case level. Um, this is the same idea with the exception that it applies to a sample instead of an individual. So we can still use um, very similar calculations um, for z-scores and apply them to sample means instead of individuals or individual cases. And so we have our critical region, right? And the critical region, what it is, is it's the areas in the sampling distribution that include unlikely sample outcomes. Um, and this, again, is related to the alpha level, right? And so typically, we test this at the alpha level of 0.05 um, or the 95% level. Um, this, this tells us that we, ha we have 95% confidence that the result that we're getting is not due to chance, right? And so as you can see here, um, here's just kind of a, a, a crude example of our critical region, um, and this is an example of a two-tailed test, right? And so our 95% range is right in the middle, and if we get z-scores that, that is outside of that critical region, then we can reject the null hypothesis or accept the research hypothesis, right? So say we have a sample that um, the, the mean is uh, far outside of the critical region. Um, we can say that, uh, that this result occurred, or it's unlikely due to chance. This occurred because of some phenomenon, right? Something occurred here to make this result happen. And the critical region for this, for us moving forward, has both one and two tailed tests. So a two-tailed test is the one that you just saw above, right? And so a two-tailed test is a, the type of hypothesis, um, what, what this is related to is the hypothesis test is used when the direction um, of the difference is not to be predicted, right? Is it can't be predicted or it's not predicted. So what I say in my hypothesis then is there's a significant difference between two groups or between the sample and the population but I don't specify in what direction. I don't say if my sample is greater than or less than the population. A one-tailed test, however, is just that, right? A one-tailed test is the type of hypothesis test used when the direction of the difference is or can be predicted. So you're stating very specifically that group A is greater than group B, or group A is less than the population, right? So you have a directional um, hypothesis there. And so let's just take a look at both of these. right? So on the right here we have a one-tailed test and so as you can see the critical region is over to one side. So the critical, so in this case we'd be making the hypothesis that our group or the test group is significantly greater than the population. right? So we're looking specifically at the greater than area, right, that area to the right, and not the area to the left. 
However, two-tailed test is looking at both sides. In this case, we're saying group A is significantly different than group B, or group A is significantly different than the population, right? So we're not specifying in what direction, we're just asking the question, are they different, and if so, how? Um, and we're not specifying in which direction they're different. Um, so this is important because this will affect your um, z-test and your alpha levels, right? Because your alpha levels will change based on this because um, your z-scores will be slightly lower if you're doing a one-tailed test compared to a two-tailed test. So let's take a moment and talk about alpha levels. So all of this stuff is all interrelated, right? Alpha levels, significance, one-tailed, two-tailed, so on and so forth. All of this stuff is very much related. So what is an alpha level? An alpha level is the proportion of area under the sampling distribution that contains unlikely sample outcomes, right? So in those um, various normal distributions that I showed you, it was the highlighted areas at, at the tail sides. Um, we reject the null hypothesis or accept the hypothesis when z-scores or t-scores fall beyond this region, right? And we'll talk about t-scores a little bit later, so don't concern yourself too much right now. Um, so what this means is that if we have mean scores, um, mean sample scores that fall beyond the critical region, fall beyond that particular alpha level that we set, then we can reject the null hypothesis or, in other words, accept the research hypothesis. Um, the standard language, however, is to say reject the null. Um, so just keep that in mind moving forward. Um, we accept the null, however, if scores fall within the critical region, so inside the body of that 95%, right? So um, in, in the, the bulk or the large part of the distribution. So if our z-scores fall within that region, then we reject, uh, reject the research hypothesis and we will accept the null hypothesis. Let's take a look at our alpha table here. And what you can see here is that uh, we have an alpha level of 0.10, for example, and that relates to a 90% confidence in accepting the hypothesis. Um, now, what that means is that if we ran this test 100 times, we would get the same result 90% of the time, and 10% of the time would happen simply due to chance, right? Um, and that's the same as we go down. Um, when we have a 5% alpha level, we have 95% confidence. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at the top line. I'm only going to explain this one um, and let you guys uh, kind of go through the, the rest of them on your own. Uh, so if we have 95% confidence or an alpha level of 0.10, our two-tailed z-score critical region is plus or minus 1.65. Our upper level one-tailed z-score is different, however. It's plus 1.29. And our lower level um, one-tailed z-score is negative 1.29. So as you can see, the z-scores vary slightly depending on whether or not we're, having a, we're, we're testing a one-tailed or a two-tailed uh, z-score. So that's really important to note. Um, and typically, we, we often use, more often than not, we use the um, alpha level of 0.05. Um, scientists, social scientists, typically typically feel confident in allowing that 95% confidence range. Um, so again, looking at the z-score, the two-tailed test is 1.69 plus or minus. Um, the upper level for a one-tailed test is 1.65, uh, and lower level uh, for a one-tailed z-score test is negative um, 1.65. Right. So again, the one-tailed test is discussing the direction of your hypothesis. So while we are statistically testing these results and we're, we're testing our data statistically, there's still a little bit of error, right? So when we're, when we're saying that we have an alpha level of 0.05, what we're doing is we're assuming that we have about 5% error there. So there's a 5% chance that we could get this wrong or that our data is actually wrong, right? And so there's a couple of types of error to tell us whether or not that occurs. Um, and, and these types of errors, we actually, um, it's very difficult to statistically test for. So the, the more conservative we are, the better, right? Um, but the more conservative we are, the more likely we are to 
reject a true result or an actual result. So it's sort of a fine balance. We have to we have to be really uh, we have to try to be as precise as possible. So there's two types of errors. Type one error or an alpha error is rejecting a null hypothesis that is actually true. Right. So if we reject the null hypothesis and say our results are um, are valid or not, excuse me, not valid, but we say that our results are statistically different than the population, for example, but that is not the case, um, then we are committing a type one error. Type two errors is rejecting a research hypothesis that is actually true, right? So instead of rejecting the null, we're now rejecting the research hypothesis. Um, so in this case, what we're doing is we're being a little too conservative, right? So the first part, we're being a little too um, liberal with our data. The second part, we're being a little too conservative, the type two error. Um, so what this means is that we have, we actually have a significant difference between our two groups. Um, however, we're, we're coming to the conclusion that we don't have significance. So here's a quick little decision box, right? So if our decision is to reject the null or accept the hypothesis and the null is actually false, the result is fine, right? We, we did okay. If we accept the null and the null is actually true, we did okay again. However, if we reject the null and the null is, is true, then we commit a type one error. If we accept the null and the null is false, we commit a type two error. Now just let me give you a quick little demonstration um, or an example on what this looks like. So say we have our research hypothesis. Our research hypothesis here is that I am pregnant. Um, and our null hypothesis is the opposite, right? I am not pregnant. So our research hypothesis here is I am pregnant. So because we have this hy hypothesis, what we do, or say your partner's pregnant, maybe not you. Um, so what we do is we go down, we buy a pregnancy test, and we do all the stuff, right? We do what we need to do and come to find out the pregnancy test shows that we are pregnant or I am pregnant, right? Um, so in this case, we're rejecting the null hypothesis and accepting the research hypothesis. However, turns out that you're not actually pregnant. So what happened here is we committed a type one error, right? We accepted the research hypothesis but the research hypothesis wasn't actually true. The null hypothesis, hypothesis was true. Now let's take another example. Same research question, same uh, research hypothesis and null hypothesis. Um, say I'm pregnant, we go down, we get the pregnancy test and come to find out the pregnancy test shows that we're not. So in this case, we accept the null hypothesis, but turns out that I am, right? And so what we've done here is we've committed a type two error. So our test tells us that we're not pregnant, leading us to accept the null hypothesis. However, the null hypothesis was wrong. And so we committed a type two error. Um, so this can happen, right? And so that's why we set those ranges at um, usually 95%, um, those, those alpha levels, um, so that we, we're sure that if we were to take these tests 100 times, we would only be wrong 5% of the time. Now once we get dig deeper into um, once we dig deeper into each of these tests, the, the, the five different tests that we'll be going over, um, each of them has a five step model of hypothesis testing. Now we're not going to get into each of these in gruesome detail. I'm just going to quickly go over them and we'll go uh, in detail with them um, when we uh, go over each test. And so the first, uh, the, the first piece here, the first step of, of um, hypothesis testing for each model is making the assumptions and meeting test requirements. So each test has various assumptions that the data need to make um, in order to use that test. And those are really important because um, if you're violating those assumptions, then your test is invalid. It's not useful at all. So for example, if you're using um, nominal data on a test that requires inter interval ratio data, um, then your test is invalid. It's not useful. Next, we need to state our null and research hypotheses. And with that, we also need to identify whether or not we're going to use a one or two tailed test. And your one or two tailed test will, will flow directly from your null and research hypotheses. So again, if you state a direction, 
you're using one tail. If you're if you're not stating a, stating a direction, you're using a two tail. Next, we select our sampling distribution and establish our critical region, right? So this is our alpha level. This is the level at which we want to set our confidence, right? Do we want to be 90% confident? Do we want to be 95% confident? Um, do we want to be 99% confident? That's up to us. We set that prior to running our models. Then we need to compute our test statistics, right? So we need to run through the process of actually calculating the data. Then we need to make a decision. Are we going to accept or reject the null hypothesis? And we need to interpret th these results, right? So as you can see here, um, when, we're, when we start getting into these more complex statistical models, um, most of this is actually not statistics, right? We're, we're really, at the end of the day, we're doing um, maybe a little more difficult math than algebra. Um, what a lot of this is, is actually making those decisions and coming to conclusions based on those decisions, right? So it's important to understand the tests that you're using and the way you're using them and how you're using them as opposed to the math. Right? We can look up the equations on the internet um, fairly easily, but what's more difficult is understanding when to use the test and under what conditions. Right? So those, that's the important piece um, moving forward, is understanding when and how to use those tests. Now finally, let's just go over the, the types of tests we'll be discussing coming up. So first we're going to be going over the single sample case. Um, so in that case, we're looking at uh, a group or a subgroup of people and comparing their scores to the population. Paired sample case is actually um, not covered in your book, I believe, um, but what the paired sample, but I think it's important, um, and particularly we use it a lot more in psychology than um, some of the other social sciences. Um, psychology uses this a lot, and so. Um, what the paired sample case is, is it, it's looking at scores and how scores have changed within the same group of people over time, right? So um, the, most, the, the most common example is um, you, look, you put somebody, say, on a weight loss program and you measure their weight before and then six weeks later after the end of the program you measure their weight post-program um, post and see if there's a change there, right? So that's the use of the paired sample case. The independent sample case is taking two samples um, and comparing them to each other on some outcome, right? So again, for example, men versus women on some outcome, let's say um, GPA, for example, um, or, or yearly earnings. Analysis of variance is very similar to the independent samples case, except um, instead of looking at two groups, we're actually looking at three or more groups and we're looking at the differences across all three of those, three or more of those groups um, on some outcome. And then a chi-squared is looking at the relationship between two nominal or ordinal variables. Um, so it's, it's similar to correlation, which we'll get into later, um, but this one is, is um, specific to those types of variables. Um, and again, we'll talk about those when we get into them later. So that is your quick introduction to hypothesis testing. Um, all, this stuff is important, and I, I, I wanted to do this one by itself because I think all of these things are uh, the all of these things underlie each of these tests. So it's important to to really understand each of these components, right? The hypothesis, the critical region, the one versus two tailed test, um, and how those are used, right? Alpha levels, type one, type two errors. Um, those components are really important moving forward because they underlie the, the remainder of these tests. All right, and so moving forward, we'll talk about each of these, um, one sample, chi-squared, so on and so forth. Uh, and we will continue our talk on hypothesis testing and uh, inferential statistics. And that is your daily dose of statistics.